For the month of June, Word Made Digital has partnered with Compassion Canada, and we're doing that in order to help a small but mighty church. This is a church of just 40 people in Northern Thailand who believe fundamentally in the best news in the world and they want to help others. So what are they doing? There are 40 people in a church serving 400 kids and youth plus their families, and we need to raise $4,000 to help them build a sports and learning center. This is about generational impact and opportunity to partner with this church with huge vision, but not a lot of resources. And it's a, a privilege to come alongside them and do that, to help tell people the best news in the world. So we're asking, would you give $40 to help us raise that $4,000? We're along the way of our fundraising goal, but we still have a ton of ways to go. And we would love for you to help us partner with this local church as they share good news. Welcome to Word Made Digital Tutorials. I'm Joanna LaFleur and I'm here with Andrew Kuman from Compassion Canada. And we're having a conversation today around what to do in a crisis or specifically how as a community, as a church leader, as a, as a Christian, how do we respond? There's a new crisis every day. It sometimes feels like in the news or certainly every week. So what do we do? When do we do it? How do we respond? So Andrew has got some, some tips for us and some insights from his own experience and what to do. Uh, so I'll pass it to you, Andrew. Sure. Thanks, Joanna. It's so great to connect with you and with your community. So I have four quick tips to help you and your organization respond to a crisis. The first is to prayerfully engage your heart. This is tough because we're limited by time and resources in what we can engage with. And there are so many crises, like you said. And I think we really need discernment about what to set our hands to. You know, pastors will often preach about how Jesus himself didn't and couldn't stop uh, when he walked through a busy street to help every single person. He couldn't address all the needs. So what do we do with that? What do we give our heart and our attention to? I think prayer is important because it can be a guide here to help us and to sustain in us a heart of compassion. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. I've been involved in the advocacy of human addressing a global crisis um, for a number of years, the global crisis of human trafficking. And I started to engage this because God really touched my heart about the issue when I learned that millions of people are trapped in modern day slavery. And now while I deeply care about the issue, the more engaged I got, I found that I could just easily rattle off statistics and numbers um, and calls to action. But as I shared stats, I started to notice how easy it was to lose the human story. Hmm, and I think right. we can get more focused on math and mobilization than on the people that God is asking us to help. So how do we protect ourselves from not simply engaging issues on autopilot? And I think here it's what prayer is the entry point. You probably know the song with that line, break my heart with what breaks yours. And I think it's an important prayer. God enables and ensures that we have his heart for the people that he wants to help through our hands. And he directs our path as we seek to make an impact. So for me, through prayer, I was reminded of the human story of trafficking all over again and was also brought, brought back to that um, story of victims and survivors. It became real again. And that was through prayer. And my, it meant my heart had to be broken all over again. Yeah. So I think that if we want to be advocates or raise funds for a cause, we need to be aware and sensitive to the human story. And that means having God's heart. So start there so that you can represent the cause that you're passionate about with honesty and humanity. So the first tip is to prayerfully engage your heart. Yeah, Andrew, I love that you're starting with prayer because that's exactly it. It feels like you can just, it's the compassion fatigue. Well, it's another thing. Or if we've been caring about the same issue for a long time, it can feel like just a bunch of statistics and not real lives that we're talking about in a crisis. So this this prayer, breaking my heart for what breaks yours, I love that as a start. But you've got some other tips because then from there, we got to do something. <laughs> we move from prayer to action. We do. And there's so many things to choose from. And I'm, I'm kind of that person, you know, who can, I love chocolate ice cream, but I can even just be, don't know what chocolate ice cream to pick, right? It's hard <laughs> to pick even things that we love, right? So for me, the second tip is directly related to the first. And that is just practically remind yourself that you can't do everything. You can't choose everything, but you can do something. 
So as you consider that human story of people in crisis, it really can be immobilizing. I think we've all felt that. For example, this global food catastrophe that experts are sounding the alarm about right now. Think about how tough it can be to miss a single meal, how it affects your day, your thinking, your mood. Now imagine there's no food or no access to it in your community. Right. I don't know if you knew, but the World Food Program highlights that close to 50 million people are facing emergency levels of hunger right now. Wow. Um, this is right now, like 2022, spring 2022. Yeah. Millions, right 50 yeah. million. And, that, and that's emergency levels of hunger. And I think there's 250 million on the brink. Right. So the numbers are big. And if you really stop to think about what hunger does to a child or about the impact it would have on someone that you love if they had no food, you kind of would be, I think it would make sense if you just want to kind of turn the other way and go to social media and doom scroll for a bit or, you know, mindlessly entertain yourselves. Um, you know, we all want to do that and sometimes we need to. But so some of these issues are so big, um, you can be intimidated to even feel like you could do anything. I mean, what can you and I do to help 50 million people? Perhaps we can't do much, but I can learn the story of one person. And when I hear their story and focus on that, my compassion can be activated. And I can imagine helping one person if I imagine their story. And I think that's a start. So that's why when you go into responding to a crisis, go with eyes wide open. Acknowledge that you will be overwhelmed. And that's important. Um, be honest with the fact that it doesn't depend on you. And I think this will help you stay the course to do the hard work that it will take to advocate for an issue that is gripping your heart. And if you've already engaged prayerfully, you'll be empowered then to engage in those hard things. So you, can, you can't do everything, but you can do something and you got to then go do it. Okay, so if we're going to go do it, we're engaged, we're prayerful, we know we can contribute something rather than just being frozen and saying, well, it's too big, I can't do anything. Uh, what's your next tip? So, you know, I'd love to give a magic bullet of this will solve any crisis. It's kind of, I think it's um, from philosophical to practical now. And it it's something as basic as have a communication plan. I mean, I, I'll acknowledge I work in comms. I work for an organization that is involved in addressing crises. And we're um, located around the world. So communicating well is so key. And I think it's important if you want to lead people into awareness or action, you need to have a plan. So take time to thoughtfully lay out what you want to say. And before that, research the issue and have some data to back up your communication. You know, you want to be clear in what you're asking people to do. So you got to start by saying, OK, do I want to raise awareness? Do I want to educate? Do I want to raise money? Maybe you want to do all of the above. but you need to understand the issue that you're talking about and know what your call to action is. So here's an example. Okay, at Compassion, I'm part of the marketing and digital growth team, and we're one of 13 teams globally that supports over 8,000 church partners in 27 countries around the world, helping kids and communities. 8,000 church partners. 8,000, yes. Amazing. It kind of is mind-blowing. And we're helping yeah. kids and communities in 27 countries, millions of kids. And, you know, right now we want to raise awareness about this global food crisis so that we can later mobilize resources because the need is so urgent. So to do that, we have to be organized. You know, we're going to end up fundraising for this and asking people to give their hard-earned money to help children. But before we do that, we want to spend some time to sort of raise the awareness that this issue is even taking place. So we're starting with a campaign. It actually launches at the end of May on World Hunger Day. Um, so this is really practical and I hope you're still like, you're not bored yet, but no, it's it, good. You it's got, you're really breaking. Having, okay. There's a problem and let's break no. down even that. As you say, what are we asking? There's five things we could do, but what is the call to action we're asking our people for? Yeah. And it might, it might come in stages, right? Like you, you might not be able to ask right away to, for the money, but you might need to convince people and show them the need. Right. And then they'll be more willing to give. And so we want to start this awareness campaign just to help people understand that there really is a crisis. It's impacted by the realities of the war with you in Ukraine, between Ukraine and Russia and that whole, you know, global crisis. And that's impacting f like the transport and distribution of food. So there's some real world impacts as a result of that. Um, and so, you know, in, to organize all these people around the world, we have just key messaging guidelines and 
images that we've selected to equip all the global partners to be able to share that message on their social media platforms and with the media and with churches that we're inviting into partnership. So you as an individual, as a pastor, as a leader can do the same thing. And maybe you already do this to a degree. You put together clear messaging guidelines that will empower people that you're working with to share that message. And it will also keep you focused because this is something we've discovered. You know, we might all have creative ideas or be passionate about an issue. Then you go, you know, life is busy. You go sit down at the computer and you're like, I don't know what to say or how to say it. So here's a few quick pointers. If you face that collecting those key facts, having, you know, thinking about the message in advance and like writing out some copy that anyone on your team can then go to a shared folder grab the copy, copy, paste, put it in the platform or the channel that fits, you know, their, the purposes of that message and then grab an image that they can attach to it. This is so useful if you're running a, if you have like a volunteer who's running your social media campaign or, you know, you're across the country and you're not in an office together to, uh, to work on something, having those core documents organized with the messaging that you've thought through and then a clear link with a clear call to action so that you're asking like a very specific and pointed thing, that's going to really set you apart and really help you as you try to address the crisis that God has put on your heart to address. Well, and I love that you're saying even the idea of a clear link, because sometimes people think, well, we want people to find it wherever they want it most conveniently. So you can call and you can email and you can text and you can uh, go to these five different web pages, whichever one you like. But as a result, it isn't clear enough. The less direction, the less actions you're saying, or the like, the less action steps they have to take to get to it. Like one website where the messaging is going to be the same consistently. Yeah, it's brilliant. Okay. Sorry. Well, and I was just, and just to add to that, that, like the less people have to think in the moment, right? Because in a crisis, like you might have a crisis that's like in your church, or you might have a crisis that's in your community that you want to mobilize people around. And the more pre-thinking that you can do, the more of like a clear funnel or pathway that you have through your messaging, the easier it will be for you to manage that. Um, and what I love about just like a single link is that if you do any data anal analysis, then you can kind of see where people are resonating with the message, where they got to your page from, and then you can start to also shape your message after it's first in market in order to like adapt right. to the way people are responding. Cause you know, if you have too many calls to action, like just think of the user, if they're on their phone and they maybe see your message like in an Instagram post, they're scrolling, so you have to stop them. And if you want them to sort of be very clear about what you're asking them to do, it needs to be just like clear and simple in the in the noisy world that we live in. Well, yeah, and, it, and even something that can help you know where to spend time in the future. Like if everyone seems to be coming to the web link from Facebook and you can see that behind the scenes in the analytics, then you can say we should invest more into our Facebook communication maybe because that might be a, something the data tells you is that our people hang out on Facebook and respond there. So that's where we want to engage with people further. Okay. You have one last tip for us. And I think, I think this tip is really key so that we don't get a big head. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, you know, I've been reflecting on this. So my last tip is to be connected to the history and to the work done by people that went before you. Um, I actually have a Substack article that's coming out this week about how a female missionary from Canada that was in China in the 1920s addressed a brutal food crisis that devastated the region and saw millions die. The woman was Rosalind Goforth. She became a missionary um, as bef she was a young, like successful artist. She was going to go to art school and then she fell in love with a preacher in Toronto, this poor preacher. <laughs> it's, it's such a neat story. Like, I think you'd love it actually, Joanna. The, awesome. I don't know if you know the Goforths. But so she was this passionate person and she was a great communicator, but she'd never been in a famine before. So here she is in China and there's this desperate situation. What she did was she helped to raise what today would be over a million dollars through a creative idea. And that saved countless lives. It came out of prayer. She was desperate and she got an idea after praying to write a letter. It was a plea to Canadians to give in a way that was even sacrificial to help save lives now, that letter, she didn't expect this. It was published in newspapers around the world. So here's a woman, a Canadian in the midst of this crisis. She serves as an example to us. It's an wow. inspiring story. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and what an amazing inheritance for any of us who want to make a difference in the midst of a crisis, right? So I think being curious and looking for examples of people like that in the past who've used tactics and techniques that brought necessary change in moments of crisis, we need to learn from them. Now, 
to me, what stands out most about this um, story of Rosalind Goforth and the letter she wrote as this SOS, sort of like this desperate plea so, um, to the world, it came out of her desperation. That's what's so interesting. It came out of her passion. She was like honest about her limitations, like we talked about before. And then her idea came out of her limitations. So scarcity isn't necessarily the worst thing. And she used the gift that she had to effectively communicate with the tools that were at her disposal, a pen and a postage stamp. That's what she had. And then she went viral in uh, the old version, the whatever yeah. the old version of viral was. That Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. 1920s version of viral, yeah. So being aware of where we fit in the history of crisis engagement is important for us to be effective. But I think like a secondary point under this fourth tip is um, don't only look to the past, but look around you to others. What other individuals, what other churches, what other organizations are also working on the same issues? Because we want to be careful not to just like drop in or perish in when a crisis comes and then get out of there. Um, and, what, you know, I think that's a legit criticism for Christians in ministry in the past um, that we want to be mindful of. And so this is what I love about compassion, a uh, bit of a shameless plug, you know, that local experts working within the community who are members of the community who know the needs and deliver the program. They're there before crisis. They're there during crisis. They're there after crisis. There's organizations all around that function like this, and that's Compassion's model. It's responsive. Um, people are present. That's what enabled us as an organization to deliver millions of food and hygiene packs during the pandemic when things right. got so desperate. And you what, already had the local no, church network. We yeah. already did. And they're going to be there when the next crisis hits. So if we're aware or the more we're aware of the allies that we have in the past and the present, um, I think we can be more successful. And then we can also share resources, right? So being connected to the history, being connected to people who are already doing the work especially in the area where the work is being done is I think really important and something for us to consider and really wrestle with. Well, and I think too, in what you're saying, it does keep you humble. It's that I'm not the first one to do this. I'm not the first one to have to ha have to address this issue. So what can I learn from the past? Um, how do I not think I'm the hero of the hour coming in? You know, there's, there is a crisis of every generation that we can respond to. So what can we learn from those who've come before us? Okay. Can you give us a quick summary of those four um, in, in case someone didn't take notes that sure, they should have right. taken. In case you couldn't follow my rambles. Okay, so here they are. The four quick tips. Prayerfully engage your heart. Acknowledge you can't do everything, but you can do something. Have a communication plan that's clear and direct. And then connect to the history of people who've done the work and to people around you who are doing the work. Awesome. Andrew, thank you so much. These quick tips, we're linking down in the show notes, of course, if people want to get more about these tips, about compassion, and uh, we'll maybe link to that Substack if we can get a link to it. We'll link to the story that you've just told us uh, awesome. about this, yeah, amazing Canadian, this amazing Canadian Canadian woman responding to crisis. So, Andrew, thanks so much. I, I hope that it will help us all respond more wisely to the next crisis uh, that our community gets to be part of. Thanks for having me.